Good morning. Welcome to Featherwood Farm. This is Darcy and I thought I would take you on a tour of our property and through the gardens and maybe the animal pen area. It is incredibly cold. It's actually only like 18 degrees out right now, but it's super beautiful. Clear sky, sun's rising up over the tree line. Everything's covered in a little bit of frost. So we'll start off at the greenhouse area. Not much has happened since my last update on that. I have been making some progress on my flagstone patio. So you can see right here, starting to take shape. Um, right now I'm just kind of fitting everything in and then once I know where all these pieces are gonna go, I'll start working on leveling it out. And if we come back this way, this is the goat house where Edith and Esther live. We put in this new fence over the past weekend. We moved it back, you can kind of see right here. This is where the old fence was. It was pretty worn out and we wanted to make space for the new expansion for the garden. So we moved that back, put in a new gate planted some fruit trees. There's two pear trees right there and a couple of apple trees right there. And I'm gonna put a sign on the top. It says Featherwood Farm. Come in. This is the main chicken coop. I'm working on putting in this little pathway, just really informal. These are pavers that I've had for a few years that I got from the uh, reuse center. And a couple of raised beds, thinking of putting like my mint in here and maybe some lavenders, some heavily scented herbs that I'm fairly sure the goats won't try to eat, but <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Back here is the bachelor pad where the majority of my roosters stay in that white one and this one is kind of defunct I have to uh, disassemble that it'll happen eventually as you can see we've had uh, a lot of trees and tree limbs falling and we're slowly working on cleaning all of that up right here is just a little jungle gym for the goats to play on, sunbathe on, good times. I actually plan on staining the goat house and the main chicken coop. I'm thinking like a weathered barn look, but I'm not 100% sure yet. And it's hard to see, but the fence runs like pretty far back. Okay, heading out of here now. This is the general area where I'm going to have my new duck house. Um, so this is a platform that I'm going to put their house on. I haven't positioned it quite how I want it yet. Um, but I'm thinking their house will sit on it and there will be like a deck and then to one side will be a, like a plunge pool for them. I actually have an old bathtub that I'm going to build a surround for um, and use that for their tub. We'll see how that goes. It's the back of the house and our fire pit garden. Okay, so coming out here, this is just a like an impromptu bed I created last year um, to throw in some perennials that I got for an excellent price at the end of the season. I have a lot of echinaceas and redbeckias, 
Um, some flax, a few shrubs, like wygella. And the daffodils are starting to push up. Here's the garden gate entrance. I would like to replace these posts with taller ones. As it is, it's not very tall, maybe six foot, maybe a little bit more than that. And do the same thing, put a larger like farm sign over the top of that. Uh, the fencing is pulled down here. I left the gate open one night and a deer went in and couldn't find the gate, I guess, and just <laughs> plowed through the fence, so. We'll fix that, not an issue. We have some pretty low areas. You can see like standing, well, it was standing water, now it's standing ice. And this is coming up on one of the beds in my side garden. There's not a whole lot to see in a late March garden in my zone. Um, things are things are starting to bud up, and yeah, the daffodils are pushing up. Here's a little crab apple. You can see little buds are starting. Um, but all I have in bloom right now are some crocus. you can see right here are some of them and I don't put any tulips in the landscape because I've tried that and it is a nightmare to protect from the deer everything in this part of the garden I actually I want to say like 50% probably I started from seed so I started Heliopsis, Agastache, um, some milkweeds from seed, Nepetas. I think I had a couple of Echinaceas make it that I started from seed. And then over here, a smaller area so I have let's see I have some penstemons culver's root liatris I have a lot of milkweed I feel like I don't even have to justify why I have so much of that a lot of grasses most of my grasses are natives um, so a lot of panicum virgatum uh, cultivars some prairie drop seed and i think that's spirobolus heterolopsis <laughs> um and some gold tufted i'm not even going to try to pronounce the latin name of that so now we're in the front of the house this little corner like diagonally and back stays pretty shaded. So I have some ferns, um, bug banes, a couple of hostas, a lot of native asters. There's some goat's beard that kind of comes out this way. And then in the summer, it starts getting way more sun. In this area, it's almost full sun. So I have a hydrangea, little ditty viburnums. Here's a weeping red bud. These are um, Kodiak black honeysuckles. They're pretty early flowering when they give tiny little yellow flowers that my bees seem to enjoy. There's a Montrose charm white spruce. It was actually a gift from our neighbors for Christmas. They know us very well. I'll be getting that planted on the side garden, hopefully very soon. And in the front here, I have a limelight hydrangea and a little bit harder to see. 
I have five Haas Halo hydrangeas, which were incredibly difficult for me to find, but I read this study published by the Mount Cuba Center that said that they were the best hydrangea for pollinators, so I wanted to get my hands on them. I, they were just little quart-sized pots last year. They uh, put on quite a bit of growth. I was very happy, and I'm expecting even more this year, so that'll be exciting to see. As you can see, started sheet mulching again, and this is some more farm-made compost, and then outside of that, arborist chips. Um, but I intend on removing this portion of the fence and putting in a gate. And just on the other side of this fence is the back of our house and there's the deck like right there. So it'll just be nice to quickly go from the deck to this front portion. And basically where this line of arborist chips is, is where I will be putting the picket fence and then everything that's covered with the arborist chips will be planted eventually. I'm using the arborist chips to smother out the grass and kind of break down, decompose, nourish the soil a bit. I use a lot of grasses for structure because I am having a very difficult time finding conifers that do well in my soil. I have pretty heavy clay soil. I have a lot of winter wet issues, standing water, and although I've built all of my beds up, um, it still seems to have been not well enough for the varieties that I've tried. So boxwood seemed to do fine, so that's good. Um, and I keep some things in planters, uh, like I have a blue globe spruce in a planter that's doing fine, a weeping white pine in a planter that's doing fine. And I want to put them in the landscape, but I'm so scared. <laughs> okay, so now we're back on the side garden in front of the cut flower garden. And we're gonna walk along the side here and go to the back half of our property. Actually, um, over here, is kind of a drainage field. If you watch my design video where I created the rendering, you would have noticed this kind of triangular shape just out in the lawn area. And that was representing this drainage field. It gets pretty flooded in the springtime and then turns into a rock hard mess in the, uh, in the summer, impenetrable. So I don't really know what to do with that as of yet. There are some native uh, dogwoods, some red twig as well as some gray dogwoods that grow along the margins. So we do plan on um, clearing out some of the invasives through here. And I've already picked up some pussy willow and some more uh, dogwood to plant on the margins. We'll get to that eventually. Okay, and along this side here, the same sort of thing. A lot of invasives that have just grown in and displaced a native understory. A lot of dead things. Um, I don't know, like 50% of this is just standing dead trees and we remove more and more every year that have fallen. We don't need anything falling on our neighbor's garage. And so here's the outside of the animal pen. And this is actually um, part of the area that we will be expanding to include the cut flower area. So we're gonna kind of just change the boundaries of the fence and bring out the line of the cut garden through here, push the animal pen in a bit and just extend this all. And then we will pull the animal pen out into the back portion to kind of compensate for the space that we took from them. This is actually one of my favorite areas of our yard. 
I love watching the sun come up back here, especially in the winter when everything's blanketed in snow and ice. It's so beautiful. Actually, that bucket looks very random, but it is a strategically placed bucket where I come at night and sit and look out. <laughs> I could bring a chair, but I have not yet. This is actually a little crick, a little drainage crick that runs from the neighbor's property line all the way across to the other neighboring property line. It's not very full yet. There is some water in there. It is basically just a stagnant flood zone that attracts mosquitoes, but my ducks absolutely love it. I plan on building little footpath bridges to connect like each side and go over the creek because this is a trail that we kind of maintain, loosely maintain. Um, the dogs like to take quick little trips through back here on it. The deer use it. So this is probably a good two and a half, three acres. That is the back half of our property. That's fairly heavily wooded. It gets denser the further you go. This part is kind of cleared out by the previous owners. So is that hole dug by the previous owners. I assume to bury garbage, honestly. We have found so many pits of buried garbage. It's pretty disturbing. A lot of rusty metal and broken glass. Starting about right here. Oh, actually, right here, if you can see the catkins hanging, is one of three hazelnuts that we have that I found growing on the property. It's the little catkin. Um, and they're all spaced far enough from each other that they don't pollinate one another. So I ordered a couple of more and got those planted last week. They're just little bare roots. So not sure how long it should take, but maybe one year we'll have hazelnuts. But starting about right here, we have maybe a dozen, probably more, counting all of the younger ones, um, red buds. And in the first and second weeks of May, it is just the most beautiful sight to see them all in bloom. I actually dug one up last year and transplanted it into the front, no, the side garden. Transplanted it into the side garden and it seems to be doing really well. And now we're coming up on the other side of the animal pen. Up in that corner is our uh, sugar shack use that term loosely. We plan on putting some rough sawn pine siding up around it later this year. It's currently just using plastic sheeting to kind of protect from the wind, but maple season finished up for us a couple weeks ago, a week or so ago. It's always a fun kind of hectic time. <laughs> and this is actually one of the other hazelnuts. So I'm gonna come in and trim them up and prune them, bring them back to good health and hope to have hazelnuts one day. And that brings us back around to the backyard.
So thank you for joining me on this cold late March morning through the garden. Not much to see yet. Give it a few weeks and the daffodils will be in bloom. More things will be budding up and leafing out and it's just going to transform.